as an inspired prophet. Unless you quote others, your readers will believe that these are inspired words or thoughts that were given from heaven, when truthfully they are of an uninspired, human-originated book. So the narrator's judgment against Ellen White in this little clip is that she should have told him that she wasn't doing what he assumed that she was doing, even though she never said that that's what she was doing. In fact, you can look in all of her books and any of the promotional materials that have to do with her books, and you won't find anywhere any statement that says that every fact, every reference, every illustration, every thought gem that's included in them was given directly by a vision and then faithfully written down. So why is it that people think that that's the way it should have been, that that's the way it was or that's what she was saying? Why did they make that assumption? It's undoubtedly because she said that her writings are messages from God. And they assume that a message from God means that everything in it came directly from God. As we noted in our introductory video, we saw that inspiration works in different ways. And it isn't always a direct vision from God, but sometimes it's doing research or it's gathering of, of Proverbs, or uh, it's hearing information and letting God guide and, and lead. So uh, the Bible doesn't set up that expectation, and, and neither did Ellen White or her son, who made some statements that were very clear about what she did. He said, in some of the historical matters, such as are brought out in Patriarchs and Prophets and Acts of the Apostles, and in Great Controversy, the main outlines were made very clear and plain to her, and when she came to write up these topics, she was left to study the Bible and history to get dates and geographical relations and to prefer, perfect her description of details. Something else. Here's another thing he wrote. This one was a little bit earlier. In the early days of her work, Mother was promised wisdom in the selection from the writings of others that would enable her to select the gems of truth from the rubbish of error. So what we find in these two quotations is uh, are three different things. Uh, he also added, it was remarkable that in her reading and scanning of books that her mind was directed to the most helpful books and to the most helpful passages contained in those books. So we see in Willie's statements that there are different reasons, different ways that Ellen White used sources. He lists three here. The first is that she looked for historical background, uh, putting it in context. Some of these little details we might find that weren't necessarily given to her in a vision, but fill in the story. The second is that she used it for the perfecting of her description of details. So it helped her with wording. And the third is that in them, she found a source of gems. She was a gatherer and selected those things that were helpful to her to express truth to her audience, whether it be one person or, or multiple people. Hinting at her own methodology, Ellen White frequently mentioned that Christ or his followers uh, dug for gems of truth in sources that mixed truth and error. And so here are just two examples of that. Truths have been dug out of the rubbish of superstition and error by earnest prayer for light and knowledge and have been presented to the people as precious pearls of priceless value. She bases on, on Jesus' own behavior. She writes about him. The principles of truth, which had been given by himself to bless the world, had through Satan's agency been buried and had apparently become extinct. Christ rescued them from the rubbish of error, gave them a new vital force, and commanded them to shine as precious jewels and stand fast forever. Christ himself could use any of these old truths without borrowing the smallest particle, for he had originated them all. So there's a, a fourth use of sources that I discovered as I was comparing her writings with others. And that is that Ellen White used 
a source as what I call a storyline guide. And a good example of that can be found in her use of John Housen's commentary in his book with his co-writer, Coney Bear, in writing sketches from the life of Paul. And also the writing of, of sketches from the life of Paul illustrates that she was not attempting to hide her use of sources. And we discover that she was urged by church members to prepare a smaller account of the life of Paul from her own commentary to be used in Sabbath school lessons in 1883 and 1884 as a student's reference guide. So at the same time that the church was already advertising and selling the book by Coney Bear and Housen, she was helping to advertise uh, and recommended their book and then sold her own book. Her recommendation was published no less than five times uh, during the course of the study. I'd say that no reasonable person knowing these facts and knowing that her readers had the option to read both of those books at the same time would ever consider that she was trying to hide the fact that, that the book was derivative, at least in part, from the larger book. Ellen White's book went through several printings, and it was a reference book as late as 1911, at the time that the expanded replacement for the book, Acts of the Apostles, came out. So it, it, it never really was hidden, as some might have suggested, and she wasn't hiding the fact that she used sources. Some people may assume nefarious motives for not footnoting every adopted uh, thought in her writings. We can find reasons in other books in, of a sermonic nature, like hers, that authors have given for not supplying the names of their sources. Let's consider a couple of them. Well, here's, here's one. They believed a well-read individual would recognize where it came from. One of Ellen White's favorite authors, Daniel March, used quotation marks to set off actual quotations in his book, Night Seems in the Bible. But in 15 out of uh, 15 quotations that I identified, 13 of those didn't give a source. Only a couple of them did. It's clearly identified as a quotation because it is a quotation. It's not an adaption. It's a quotation. But he doesn't tell us where he got, got it from because he assumes that the well-read individual understands that. We learned this from uh, the researcher Tiller J. Mazio. She's a historian of this period. She she said, at this time, a work would be considered implicitly acknowledged or vowed if a well-versed reader could be expected to recognize the original. So no, no need to uh, burden the page with all of that information because people would know. It, why clutter up the page? A second reason was given actually during the Romantic period, which was uh, the period just before Ellen White was here, but those books were still available. The second reason is, so truth revealed could speak for itself. Rather than, because so-and-so taught it, it should speak for itself. And we find John Wesley saying, I resolved to name none of my sources that nothing might divert the mind of the reader from keeping close to the point in view and receiving what was spoken only according to its own intrinsic value. So the reader can judge for themselves, not because of who said it. A third reason for not putting the name of the sources in, in these works, uh, we find from another author who wrote, about the same time as Ellen White wrote The Desire of Ages, well, just prior to that time, William Hanna, and he was a source for her. He wrote in his preface, he has refrained from all critical or doctrinal discussions as alien from the object he had in view, nor has he thought it necessary to burden the following pages with references to all the authorities consulted. So that was from William Hanna, and that was his reason. And his presentation is very sermonic, like Ellen White's. In fact, she uses his work as a storyline guide for many of the chapters. Of, of her book. It helped her to look at those storylines. A fourth reason, it's related to some of what we saw here before, is by stated by um, an author by the name of Gonzalez, 
whose book came out just the year after Ellen White's. He said, to make such an acknowledgement in the form of a catalog would expose me justly to the charge of pedantry. So his reason was to avoid pedantry, which is academic show, just putting it in there to show how smart you are, how academic you are. And he avoided that because he just wanted to keep it to the message. We see in Ellen White's writing many of the same things. It looks just about the same. She wrote for those reasons and just wanted to tell the story simply, not loading it down with notes. In fact, when I was doing research on the Desire of Ages, at one time they thought about putting marginally notes as some of the more academic sources did, but they decided against it because they wanted to keep it simple. An additional reason, adding to those, for not listing sources from Fanny Bolton, who worked for Ellen White. In fact, she had some trouble because when she worked for her, she wanted credit for being an editor. And actually, uh, editors often don't get uh, noted in, in the credits for a book. Many of the books that I've edited, my name appears nowhere. And it was true in that time as well. But she wanted credit. She was a she was a writer and a gifted writer, and she wrote many things before she had joined Ellen White's staff. But because of that, she had stirred up some trouble for Ellen White. She wrote this: "I thank God that He has kept Sister White from following my supposed superior wisdom and righteousness, and has kept her from acknowledging editors and authors." but has given to the people the unadulterated expression of God's mind, had she done as I wished her to do, the gift would have been degraded to a common authorship, its importance loss, its authority undermined, and its blessings lost to the world. This fifth reason for not emphasizing where phrasing originated and for not crediting Ellen White's editors in her books is that it puts the message on a technical level rather than a spiritual level. And we can definitely see how that has happened. As people look at the technical side, they forget to look at the spiritual side. In this very series, I'm calling attention to the technical side of the process, yet I'm asking the reader to then lay aside that part of the production of the books and just read her writings and let them speak to your soul. On this whole matter, I think even today I would say that I know of no author who uses quotation marks for scattered verbatim words here or there, three or four words here or there, that they borrowed from another author, or who inserts a footnote just to be able to tell the reader, I have rewritten a nice piece uh, of wording, a, a nice gem of thought from such and such an author. Just put it in. If it's reworded, just put it in. Authors footnote material to give credit for a specific quotation or to reference source material so that you can do further study. Not just to give credit for a string of three or four words or to say that you reworded somebody else's beautiful thought gem. Ellen White did describe her use of sources very clearly. As the narrator mentioned, she specifically drew, uh, described using sources in her lengthy author's preface in the 1888 edition of The Great Controversy, which was also published in the revision of 1911. Here's what she said, and it was slightly reworded later because there were some changes in the 1911 use of, of referencing in it. She said, as the Spirit of God has opened to my mind the great truths of his word, and the scenes of the past and the future, I have been bidden to make known to others what has thus been revealed. In pursuance of this purpose, I have endeavored to select and group together events in the history of the church in such a manner as to trace the unfolding of the great testing truths that at different periods have been given to the world. And then a little bit further down. In some cases where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been quoted, but except in a few instances, no specific credit has been given since 
They're not quoted for the purpose of citing that writer as authority, but because his statements, statement affords a ready and forcible presentation of the subject. So the wording helped her to say it succinctly and forcibly. Now, I, I want to point out something, though, about this introduction. Some say, well, that's in the last book of in the series, and sequentially it is the last book in the series, but actually, it was the first in the series to be published. So it, we can view this author's preface as an introduction to the series, and a series that would be, wouldn't be completed until Ellen White's death. So we had Great Controversy, and then Patriarchs and Prophets, then Desire of Ages, then Acts of the Apostles, and last of all, uh, prophets and kings, all of those in not in sequential order. So the very first one written was the last one in the series, and she considered a very important book. Some have thought that this preface was written under pressure. So I explored that possibility one time when I was visiting the Ellen G. White estate in Silver Spring, Maryland. I walked into the library where they have various editions of her books uh, for reference, and I picked up the 1884 Great Controversy, which is titled The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, and I began flipping through the pages to discover that there were many quotation marks with ellipses. That's the dot, 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 showing that she had left out a part of what was previously written. I also discovered that sometimes she had quotation marks nested within quotation marks. So one who was being quoted had already had been quoting something else, which is a sure sign that she's quoting published material. And I, I later found that in the style of the day, she did give several general references to a source, as she mentioned. She said not, not in every case did she footnote it, but there were many cases going through the pages. Page 41, she refers to a Christian, which was Tertullian. On page 90, she referred to this old writer which was the 17th century Thomas Fuller, or on page 154, a Catholic writer, which was Cochleus, or on uh, page 157, a bigoted papist, which was Faber, and on 160, one of the reformers, which was Farrer, or on 163, one of the princes, which was John Frederick. Now, I, I thought about that. Why didn't she give specific names? because it wasn't essential to the story. Storytellers give as much information as is important to deliver what they're trying to say. And she left out some of those details. She didn't want to get bogged down. She didn't want that, that to, to be an extra thing that's not needed. And she gave her readers credit for being able to see that she was using sources. It was all over when I looked for it. However, not everybody is as observant. And she later realized that. So she, she included a plain statement about the use of historical sources in the next edition of the book, from 1884 to the 1888 edition. And that's why it made it into that book and carried over into 1911. And as time continued and expectations about giving credit that continued to change and develop, she was told about it and she said, well, by all means, put in the references. So she authorized her workers to add in references in the great controversy that we find today. And it was a whole lot harder back in that time uh, than it is today. I've, I've been able to locate a lot of these things just searching on the internet, but that would have been harder at that time. But they did it, 1911 edition. You see, Ellen White had concerns. As we, we look through her experience, we, we see her writing career, that she had certain concerns uh, and, and many reasons why she could have never been a published author. When she was nine, many of you have heard this story about how she dropped out of school because of an injury that, that disfigured her face and, and it nearly took her life. And, and it left her sickly as she probably imbibed blood that went down into her lungs. And she had a, a kind of a consumption or tuberculosis for many years after that. And then when she was 12, she thought she had recovered enough to go back to school three years later. And even still, it was too hard. Uh, she had to drop out again 
because of the stress of the environment was, was just too much for her. At 17, she was sickly, she was shy, and she was very hesitant when she received her first vision to share what God was asking her to share with others. Yet in the process, her primary concern was that her ego might get in the way. She said, I earnestly begged that if I must go and relate what the Lord had shown me, that I might be kept from exaltation. And she was assured that providence would keep her humble in her role as a messenger for God. She published for many years after that, married James White, and he helped her, until a crisis occurred when she was in her 40s. Her husband suffered a series of strokes, and she wrote in her diary this of her concern. My husband is too feeble to help me prepare them for the printer. Therefore, I shall do no more with them at present. I am not a scholar. I cannot prepare my own writings for the press. I am thinking I must lay aside my writing I have taken so much pleasure in and see if I cannot become a scholar. I am not a grammarian. I will try, if the Lord will help me, at 45 years old to become a scholar in the science. God will help me. I believe he will. Well, God did help her, but it wasn't to backfill her education that she had missed at those early years. She never did master the technical aspects of writing, but God provided help for her to prepare her letters and her books and her articles for others to read. Issue by issue, God met her concerns. First of all, she didn't want her ego to get in the way. He took care of that. She didn't want her inability to get in the way. Her husband helped her, and then later others joined. She didn't want the details to get in the way. As we noticed, she left out some of the stuff that would have been extraneous and would have gotten in the way. She didn't want the technical aspects to get in the way. We see that in, in the way that she produced her books. She left out a lot of the technical aspects of it, as those early writers described themselves, that they just wanted it to speak for itself. And less of all, we just discovered that she didn't want academic expectations to get in the way. So she said, put in the footnotes, no problem. By his grace and his providences, none of these things got in the way until somebody started complaining because they thought she should have done it a different way. But when Ellen White openly described using sources and recommended that others use some of those same sources, shouldn't that alter our assumptions that everything that she wrote came directly from God? If you've ever had a notion about what someone looked like from only hearing their voice, say on a radio or something like that, maybe on a phone, and you saw that person and they didn't match your expectations, did you say, ah, oh, that can't be so-and-so. I saw that person in my head. No, you adjusted your assumptions to match reality. As we saw in the introductory video, inspiration in the Bible looks different than what we might expect. So my question is, why should we judge Ellen White according to a naive notion about inspiration that isn't even true of the Bible. Glad you stopped by. God bless you. We'll see you in the next video.